Hi, I'm Bill Crystal. Welcome to Conversations. I'm very pleased to be joined today by old friend David Epstein, and we're going to discuss The Federalist, uh, about which uh, an important book about which David wrote an important book. I think the best book written on The Federalist. It came out almost, it was the dissertation. Uh, we were in grad school together, and it came out almost 40 years ago and stands up very well, and it's still in print. That's pretty amazing, David. I don't know if this, that's, 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 that's a self-attribute, I'm sure. I'm hoping this will spike sales. Totally. So people need to order it. That's the first thing I need to say. <laughs> this conversation does not replace your obligation to read the whole book and, and study it. The book's called The Political Theory of the Federalist, published by the University of Chicago in 84. Uh, David and I both uh, got our PhDs from Harvard, both taught a little bit and left the academy. David went on to actual serious work in the Defense Department and did some good for the country, and I went on to whatever. And uh, But obviously, David speaks today as an individual and not, not, does not represent the U.S. government and all of its different tributaries and uh, whatever, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> You're speaking as an individual. Um, so let's talk about the Federalist and uh, maybe a little less on the political theory of the Federalist, which the book is really excellent on, and more on, you know, kind of political lessons from the Federalist. But uh, I, I'm sure our, our viewers, of course, have, have read The Federalist, I'm sure, studied it. But in case they haven't, give, give, a, give a quick quick reminder about The Federalist Papers. Okay. Um, thank you. It's great to be here. I'm a big fan of the show, so it's a pleasure to, to join you. Um, you know, after the Philadelphia Convention of 1787, the Constitution, as drafted, was submitted for ratification by each state in popular conventions. And as soon as it was uh, released publicly uh, after this secret uh, meeting all summer, uh, there began a big debate, uh, started out, I think, mostly by the opponents, joined by the proponents. And Alexander Hamilton thought the debate was a little bit uh, crude and uh, maybe not going quite his way. And he thought what was needed was a more comprehensive treatment that would defend the Constitution as a whole, not just attack individual anti-federalists for their, uh, their, their criticisms. So he recruited uh, other people to help him. Uh, he planned out a long series of essays. The, the book is called The Federalist. It's a collection of 85 essays. Uh, I think it's probably better not to think of it as like op-ed columns that have been collected together uh, after they were written, more like uh, say Dickens writing a novel and publishing pieces of it as he goes along, uh, because in Federalist One, Hamilton lays out this rather elaborate plan of what's going to be discussed and pretty much sticks to it. Uh, the co-authors, uh, John Jay, James Madison, uh, Hamilton had invited a couple of other people, one of whom said no, one of whom wrote something, and then Hamilton, I guess, politely told him that didn't quite meet Hamilton's needs. And, um, in, in the musical version, Hamilton invites Aaron Burr to help, and Burr says no, which is apocryphal, but uh, correct in that Burr himself was ambivalent and kind of joined the pro-Constitution people rather late. So the, you know, the project was to recommend this form of government to both the people who were electing uh, delegates to these conventions, also to the delegates themselves, some of which were undecided or actually changed their minds, uh, and to contribute to, to the debate. And they had in mind that it would last beyond perhaps the immediate moment, right? There's some indications of that and guide us in the future too. Yes. Um, I mean, there's actually a passage, I think, where Hamilton says, if certain political principles espoused by the anti-federalists became the political creed of the country, it would unfit us for any government whatsoever. So it makes you wonder what kind of political creed uh, is necessary for the country, what, what kind of instruction the federalist was trying to give us um, since, I mean, I think, you know, it's both an explanation of the institutions, which say have a kind of life of their own, but also uh, an attempt to educate and instruct the people who will obviously have some say over how the institutions develop. I mean, I mean as citizens, we, we have that. We also have the right to amend the constitution. So it's kind of important what we believe about it, but also to instruct say politicians as to what 
what's uh, what's their role? Yeah, and how they should think about this system that's been set up. I guess I, I was just struck listening to you. I hadn't really thought about this. I mean, the Constitutional Convention was in private. So the, if you're a normal, you know, interested in politics, well-informed citizen, but you were not personally one of the, how many people were there at the Constitutional Convention, whatever that was, uh, you know, 50, not that many. something like that. Was it uh, 55? I don't know. Maybe I'm confusing the declaration, whatever. But, you know, the, several dozen people who were there. That wasn't secret. There weren't many reports, even, I think, about what they were discussing, right? And then suddenly this constitution is sort of delivered up to be debated and, and, and ratified in state conventions. I think the extent to which they were sort of painting on a tabula rasa is probably something one doesn't. I mean, of course, America there already been the declaration and the war and other and the, and the confederation so it wasn't quite a tabula rasa but the degree to which they were able to impress that, that this was a chance to impress upon the country this particular understanding of what underlay the constitution and informed it i, I sort of hadn't quite focused on perhaps yeah although I, I mean i don't think they're speaking for the convention exactly they're i mean jay in fact was not at the convention so mm. it's more like you know we whoever we are, I mean, it's published anonymously, um, have assessed this document that was released right. to us. I think, I mean, I think it's, it's obviously very interesting also to read the convention debates, you know, based on notes that people took, uh, although this was not published for quite a while afterwards, but there's a kind of different character. I mean, at the convention, it's sort of, why are we choosing this individual uh, provision rather than that, or what, you know, why should the president be appointed this way or have a four-year term? In the Federalist, it's really not about the individual provisions. It's sort of a take it or leave it. I mean, this the argument is this this is what we have available to us, and it's a better option than uh, any plausible alternative. So it's it's really what's the merit of the system as a whole. So it gives us a real view of it as a whole in a way that you don't get from the debates. And uh, that's why you could write a book on the political theory of the Federalists. Yeah. Probably not well, maybe, on the political theory of the convention, so to speak. It's more, yeah, right. it, it's uh, less of a whole. Or it, the, the Federalist tries to make the Constitution coherent. Um, maybe more coherent than it was in the practice of these compromises. Right. Although they, I, I guess they admit points on which you know it right. could have been better... Um, uh, but that's also an important teaching lesson, I think, in a way, right? That uh, the limits of what one should expect, that's pretty explicitly discussed in the Federalists from politics and from constitution making and so forth, right? So yes, like, yes. I mean, I think that's part of sort of the educational role of the book is gives us an idea of what standards we should apply when we're thinking about government. I think this is applicable not only to Americans, um, but what can you expect Um and I think, you know, there's a little bit of, um, I would say, a caricature that says they had this great optimism about what the science of politics could do and uh, sort of solve the problem. I mean, they, they really present it much more experimentally and say what we're trying to do is improve the probabilities of a good outcome. And really, that's the, the best we can offer. And it's important that citizens, but as you say, political leaders as well, uh, think in a sense that way. I guess that's what struck me skimming back through it and, and your book as well, preparing for this, that, you know, we just celebrated, so tell me what you think of this, stage. I mean, we just celebrated July 4th, we're speaking on whatever it is, July 7th, and um, uh, the declaration and the, the rigging sentences and uh, assertions of the declaration and then the subsequent sort of reassertions of it by Jefferson in his great last letter, uh, 50, almost 50 years later. It's so interesting, the Federalists, I, I don't, I mean, I don't, I don't think we buy the, I don't buy the argument that the Federalist was a, fundamentally a departure from the Declaration the way old fashioned historians used to argue it was a conservative reaction to the radicalists of the Declaration. But it's certainly a different kind of document and it, it's one of its main purposes. The Declaration is an assertion of certain fairly simple truths and the Federalist is a education in the complexities of politics and of institutions, right? It's, a, it's sort of the other side of the, uh, of the declaration or, or something like that. Yes, and, and I think, um, you know, there's sort of this tension between, uh, let's say, describing the noble possibilities and how people really ought to think of things on the one hand and this sort of realistic view of what's actually likely on the other. I mean, I think sometimes, you know, you read the Federalist and you have this uh, 
sort of view that not that much is, is expected of politicians because men are rapacious and selfish and so on. And, and you know, it says enlightened statesmen will not always be at the helm, uh, but that doesn't mean they're never at the helm or that they couldn't be. And so it seems the Federalist tries to maybe model good behavior or show us what, what it's like to be a, a good democratic politician, um, even while warning us and trying to guard us against the, the danger that enlightened statesmen will not always be at the helm. I noticed it only cites the declaration, I think this is right, I at least looked in the index, once in the entire Federalist Papers, and, and it's in Federalist 49, a very important paper, and it slightly cuts against, it's too strong maybe the declaration, but it, it, it it's that's the paper that argues for reverence for the Constitution, so it sort of is not like, let's have a revolution every you know 25 years or whatever. The, so. Well, I, the declaration didn't really urge a revolution every 25 years either. I mean, it says... You know, you don't want to do anything for light and transient causes. Fair enough, yeah. Um, I mean, the way the declaration is actually, I would say, more tolerant of um, kind of tacit consent in that a government that has the consent of the people doesn't actually have to be instituted by consent of the people. Uh, in the Federalist, we're talking about actually instituting government by consent. You're not just inheriting an old government and deciding, you know, that's close enough, we're okay with it, or... But, but we're in a position where we actually are, are choosing a new government. Um, and I, I think they, you know, they present this as sort of the test case of the whole social contract theory that John Locke famously said, you know, I've refuted divine right. All that's left is the rule of beasts and whoever's strongest wins it, unless I can establish this principle that government by consent of the governed is the legitimate foundation of government. And in Federalist One, Hamilton says, we Americans are in the position, or he says, it's been said that we Americans are in a position to establish whether that's true or not. This is a, a great experiment in whether government by consent of the governed actually could be the origin of government. You stress in the book that how important uh, that the Federalist stress, Publius, the Federalist, the author, or the um, pseudonymous author of the Federalist stresses, that the government is and has to be really wholly elective that, that uh, in its sources. I mean, uh, second, it can be indirect at times, but that there is no other principle but rule of the, the choice of the people. Um, yes. I mean, this is, I guess, related to uh, the question that, sort of was, was big in my mind when, when writing the book, which is why are we so sure we want a wholly popular government or what's also called a wholly elective government? Um, because if you start, you know, if you start from the beginning of the book, uh, there's a kind of, uh, I would say almost syllogism or debater's case that says, uh, sort of deduces what we need uh, for, the, for the US. It's, and there's three sections of, of the beginning. It says, we need the union. And the Articles of Confederation are not gonna preserve the union. Third point, to preserve the union, we need a government at least as energetic as the proposal. So that structure doesn't really say anything about popular government. It says, what we're trying to do is institute a good government or in this formulation, an, an, a sufficiently energetic government. And in fact, <laughs> the way he puts it, the third part is, at least as energetic as the proposal. Maybe the proposal is not quite energetic enough. Hmm. Um, so there you, um, you don't really get a, a clear argument for popular government, but volume two is officially on, this is starting at number 37. Uh, the official subject is the conformity of the proposal to the, two, to the true principles of Republican government. And you know, Madison discusses what he calls the genius of Republican liberty, which he says includes the idea that government should be by many hands for short terms. And then he says, this is kind of conflicts with the requirement of energy, which require, requires uh, a certain duration of power and a single hand. 
So you could say the most energetic government would be something like Thomas Hobbes recommended as a, an absolute monarch. Um, and clearly that's not wholly Republican or not even partly Republican. But why, why is it that we want to have a popular government even though the, the sort of syllogism of volume one didn't really point that way? And you know, part of it is clearly, you could say, you could derive popular government from the ends of government. Uh, we, we want a government that serves the public good and having representatives of the people uh, elected by the people gives us a way of making sure that they're not simply in it for themselves and, and are serving the public good. But that doesn't quite answer the question because England has this very respectable government where there is this role of representatives, but there's also a king, there's also a house of lords. Those are what Madison calls self-appointed authorities. And from the standpoint of the, the purposes of government or the public good, there's a certain argument to be made for them. But Madison's claim is, you know, we, we don't accept that. It's indefensible to have a government that's not wholly elective. And I think this, the, the argument, I think ultimately boils down to something more like human pride or the passion of human beings who want to rule or do not want to accept the idea that they need some other authority than one, than one they can supply themselves. Sorry, that, that, that's that's one ended, but... <laughs> What's that? No, that's good. No, and that's, I developed that, but that is one, I think, one of the distinctive arguments in your book, and I think you maybe thought it to be, and, and it's worth elaborating, which is it's not, the equality is not just a kind of negative or the desire to have Republican government, let's just say, it's not a, it's safer because they're less likely to be oppressed or, or more likely to even preserve our rights. So that is argued as well, of course, but a kind of the, the dignity almost of, of, of self-government is, is also really stressed more than one remember, you know, unless you, it's not, this is not captured, I think, by the normal accounts of the Federalists focus on Federals 10 and 51 and interest, ambition, counteracting ambition and interest checking in, you know, interest being spread over the whole country and so forth. It, it, that, but that part of it is visible when you, when you look at the, the work as a whole. Yes. Um, I mean, I guess I, I actually began my work by contemplating Federalist 10. I mean, I was, you know, the, I would say the traditional interpretations all have a kind of economic cast that uh, starting with say Charles Beard in the early 20th century wrote the economic interpretation of the constitution. Um, and then famous political scientist, Robert Dahl wrote about pluralism and he thought Federalist 10 is a kind of prototype of pluralism, which means interest group politics. Uh, Martin Diamond who wrote, I think the best work that I had read on the, the political theory of the Federalist uh, also emphasized a certain economic aspect that this was a kind of uh, anti-Marxian analysis before Marx, where if you have a variety of interests, uh, you're not limited to the, to the division between the bourgeoisie and the proletarians. And one day in graduate school, when I was reading Federalist 10 for maybe the 10th time, I hmm. noticed this, uh, the official definition of faction, um, which mentions not only interest, but passion. Uh, it says a faction is a number of citizens, whether a majority or minority, moved by some impulse of passion or interest adverse to the rights of others or to the permanent aggregate interests of the community. And I sort of wondered, what's this passion are people passionate about their interests? Uh, it's clearly not erotic passion. It's some sort of anger or spirit. And as I read Federalist 10 more carefully, I noticed Madison really distinguishes between passion and interest. And there's a certain kind of faction that's moved by passion. Uh, these say a, a, a faction attached to a certain popular leader, or attached to a certain opinion. And then that's distinct from the factions that are moved by interest, which he says, that's the most common and durable case. Um, but in a way the factions moved by passion are more dangerous and more antagonistic 
Whereas, you know, you have a difference of interest with somebody, you try and work it out. But so I think this passion is, is um, I mean, I we sort of began to look at this theme more carefully. And I think it's related not only to partisanship uh, among the people, but ambition among the rulers. And it's the sort of political spirit that explains why, <clears throat> as he says in Federalist 39, we have this honorable determination to base all our political experiments on the capacity of mankind for self-government. Uh, so it's, it's that political spirit. And it's, it seems to me different from a kind of liberal view, which says, you know, from, from say, if you look at Locke uh, in the state of nature, we, we have these desires we're thwarted by the fact that it's a very violent place. And so we need a government that's going to protect our individual uh, rights. And I mean, Locke sort of goes in the direction of representative government, but it's really a kind of deduction from the end. Whereas in Federalist, in the Federalist, it seems there's, there's interest in this end, obviously, but there's also this separate root of the attachment to popular government. Um, and you know, without suggesting that the Federalist is Aristotelian, I would just notice, you know, in, in Aristotle's politics, he says, man is a political animal. And this is because we have reason. I mean, that's kind of the the, the usual summary of it, but it's not quite reason. It's we have we have enough reason to argue. People have opinions about what's good and what's ad, what's just, what's advantageous. And they dispute those opinions. That's that's kind of built into our nature. And I think this disputatious character of human beings is uh, very much evident in the Federalist once you you start looking for it. Uh, you know, today I think people have suddenly discovered affective polarization, where everyone is, is very angry at people in the other party. But this is really something that the Federalists noticed as well. No, very much so. I mean, I was struck by this the last few years. Federalist one goes out of its way, really, almost unnecessarily in a certain way, Hamilton, to say, you know, this will be like every other occasion where something important is being debated. People will be will be making false assertions. They'll be all wrapped up in it. They'll love their own leader, right? I mean, you've right. a version and, of- And they will get angry at each other uh, and, uh, you know, in, indulge in, vituperation of the opponents, even though he says that's imprudent because you can't really convince anybody by attacking their motives. And, um, but uh, that, that's what's gonna happen, he says. It's, um, you know, politics is not, um, he says it would be, what would be great is if we could have a calm discussion of what's most advantageous for the country. But he says that is more seriously more ardently to be wished than seriously to be expected. Right. This reminds me of uh, President Johnson used to say, come let us reason together. Which <laughs> right. This is a, a biblical verse where I, th I think in the original, it doesn't quite have Johnson's meaning. <laughs> but I think that's what this ideal deliberation would be. Um, but we don't quite reason because as Madison says in Federalist 10, our reason is mixed with our self love which I guess it seems very obvious to us, um, but you know, why do we love our own opinions so much? Madison says, we have fallible reason. So you know, why don't we just say, you know, here's my best opinion, but if, I'm, if you disagree, well, that's okay. Or even if I'm outvoted, that's okay. But that's, that's not the way people feel. Especially not about politics, right? I mean, they, in other things, people might have more of that attitude of, you know, uh, what's the phrase I'm looking for? Uh, you know, it's a matter of taste or, you know, uh, don't, don't, <laughs> don't dispute. Uh, I mean, people don't, even there, they get all passionate about art or music and stuff. But, but yes. somehow politics well, particularly uh, in, involves. But, you know, there's this interesting thing I was noticing, and I think it's in Federalist 70, where Hamilton is recommending a single executive rather than having two people because he says whenever two people try to do anything together there is danger of disagreement 
it sort of makes you wonder how marriage is ever possible. That you know anything you try to do, there, there will be disagreement. He says, if you are not consulted, you are very upset. And he says, if you are consulted, you're even more upset if they don't do what you want. And this is particularly true, he says, where, as was he was contemplating for having two presidents, it's particularly if you have two people who have equal authority. Well, this is exactly the situation of all citizens, that we have equal authority with everybody else, and yet we have this danger of disagreement. And so reason to be distressed. I mean, I want to get to the institutions in a second, which is one of the major ways, obviously, that these twin desires or, or requirements of fulfilling the requirements of popular government and that of good government get worked out, so to speak, or, or those two get reconciled to the degree they can be, or anything, or ever, you can ever ensure, you can't really ensure a good government, but to the degree you can make it more likely. But just on this, one more, on this point of the, so would you say then that the federal solution in a way to this uh, passionate love of one's own opinions and overestimation of it, it isn't simply a kind of, you know, let's have a big country and let's have separation of powers, but it is a kind of uh, building up of a, a kind of pride in what we're doing here in America, in the United States, in terms of self-government, that you sort of channel that uh, uh, feeling in a, in a different way. That would explain a little bit maybe the claims of Federalist One and some of the and elsewhere in the, in the Federalist as well. It's, it, it, it's not a kind of debunking of this is a noble, you, you, one way to go would be to say, calm down, you know, politics is always a mess, complicated, don't, don't, don't overstate what we're doing here, but he, they go the opposite direction, really. Yeah, I mean, you could say, you know, Hobbes's argument is essentially calm down, uh, right. Uh, suppress those passionate opinions. Um, I mean, I think there it's, I, I'm not sure I fully worked out the relation between individuals having this passionate love of their own opinions and then the people as a whole having an honorable determination for popular government. I mean, it's as if somehow the, the whole people recognizes that each individual can't really be talked out of having his own opinion count uh, in this whole. We, if we follow Federalist One, it is that kind of carefully qualified statement by Hamilton that it seems to have been, you know, uh, reserved to the people of this country to whatever, vindicate once and for all, in a sense, the, the, the possibility of government by reflection and choice. I mean, I've always thought that was, on the one hand, it can't quite be true. I mean, it can't, I mean, it'd be unlikely if one particular instance could prove or disprove something that it could just go wrong, right? And we could have had some bad luck and somewhere else could could do it. But it's important. I, he seems to turn that desire for a kind of, uh, uh, you know, we're special, let's say. Uh, and, and the individual, the individuals that become part of a collective body politic that feels a kind of pride in what this whole experiment, and maybe that then helps suppress a little bit uh, the tendency to just think your own individual opinion is the only one worth having, right? This is why in moments of crisis, people put aside their own petty partisanship, presumably, let's say, you know, and join and, you know, fighting World War II or something, right? We're all proud of what we're doing there. And we forget a little bit that we're liberals or conservatives or big government or small government, or we didn't like parts of the New Deal or something, you know, D-Day kind of Trump, trumps that. Is that, there's, that seems to be sort of anticipated, don't you think? Yes. Uh, I mean, I think, you know, there's certain... Um, arguments for moderation. I mean, you know, Madison says, you won't have parties if there's a universal alarm for the public safety. So once the American Revolution began, uh, there was not division, although they do say before it began, there was division because there was not universal alarm. It was only after we declared independence and were at war that there was this universal alarm. But there's also the, you know, the argument that given uh, certain necessities making themselves apparent. I mean, this is kind of the argument made to the people of 1787, which is we're in a situation where we need to moderate our own individual opinions. So uh, this is again, a case of kind of urging better behavior while noticing and uh, being able to take account of worse behavior. But, but, but just to finish this point, but, but moderate your opinions, but the kind of reward you get for a little bit of moderation or suppression of your own particular 
preference for this kind of legislature or that kind of you know Supreme Court terms or something, uh, or more federalism or less federalism, the reward you get is this pride in a successful enterprise, a successful effort at self-government, which is of universal importance. So you, you, it's not simply a kind of give up on your, on your opinions. Yeah, I, th I think that's fair. Yeah, but let's so maybe more famous. So that's, I think that part is very interesting, and I think you you really bring that out well, and kind of a neglected aspect of the Federalists, but also of the founding as a whole, and of maybe even of American history as a whole. You know, that the, the degree to which it's some about more than it, it tries to you know about more than kind of interest group pluralism, um, but also makes very important to have that pluralism and that interest group arrangements and separation of powers to make the thing work. I mean, it's such an interesting combination in that respect of a grand ambition and a very hard headed organization of the institutions and attitude towards the kinds of people who are going to be there and so forth. But, but say a word about some of the institute, what are the key popular governments? you got popular government, you got the good government. Uh, I mean, which particular, parts you think are most important or most striking or most instructive, I guess, and the, the, and the ways that the Federalist defends them. I mean, I guess, you know, the, the big question of volume two is how do you make a popular government a good government? Um, and I guess I would emphasize maybe separation of powers, um, representation, and then sort of the, the more permanent branches, which are the Senate, the president, and, and the court. I mean, maybe we should talk a little about separation of powers because I think that brings out a little bit this, this um, difficulty between good government and, and popular government. And the parts, and say we're also about the parts of good government that seem particularly difficult to achieve in a, in a republic because they, they seem to stress that, right? It's... Yeah, that, I mean, that kind of comes out, um, I think later, you know, the separation of powers, I think, is sometimes described as uh, hard to understand or a confusing doctrine. I think there's sort of a, a narrow version of it that's, I would say, very clear that you can read in uh, Locke and, and Montesquieu and in Federalist 47, which is simply separation of powers is a way of having rule by law. You know, you don't have decrees. It's better to have rule by law because everybody knows what they're allowed to do. You don't, don't suddenly get punished for something you, you did. Um, and by having a separation of powers, you separate the executive from the legislature. And that's a way of improving the laws by making sure that the executive can enforce the law against the legislators. Uh, because if they could make the law and enforce it, they might not obey it themselves. And so this, this is an improvement of the law. And then Montesquieu adds <clears throat> the separation of the judiciary, which is a further improvement because instead of having the executive enforce the law on you, you get to, to question it. I mean, if, if you don't want to accept the executive's decision, his judgment of you, you, you get to appeal to a neutral outsider who hears it as, as a dispute. So that's that's the idea. I, I would say Madison points out a couple of uh, limitations. I mean, it's a, it's a good idea, but for one thing, uh, rule of law is not a complete solution because you could still have laws themselves that are not just. Uh, in Federalist 10, he says, what are uh, many acts of legislation except judging the rights of large groups of people? So that really neutrality is not guaranteed by the fact that something's a law because there are different interests, different people in different situations. Uh, you know, a tariff hurts one guy and it helps another guy. So law is not a complete solution, even though it's a very good idea. And then the second point I say Madison emphasizes is self, that this separation is not self-enforcing, um, that is, you can distinguish these three powers, but there's a danger that if you specify that they should all exist, they don't get to preserve themselves. And in this uh, run of papers between 47 and 51, the, the relation between this and popular government comes out when Madison quotes Jefferson's notes on Virginia. 
Jefferson had some scheme of a, a kind of constitutional revision system designed to enforce the constitution by appealing to popular conventions. It's, it's very strange that Madison even brings this up because it doesn't say anything about separation of powers. You know, this book is like 11 years before. It's not like it was on anyone's mind, but it seems as though Madison wants to make a point. <clears throat> and I think the point is the people are not going to be the ones who enforce the separation of powers. Uh, Jefferson's convention idea said, you go, just go to the people and let them decide whether the constitution has been properly obeyed. Madison makes a lot of objections. The main one is the people are going to be partisan. They're going to have their own opinions about this that are not neutral. They're based on the people's prior attachment to the president or the, the Congress. Um, who are having this dispute. So the overall conclusion is separation of powers can only be enforced by uh, the interior structure of the government. Uh, this is the kind of climax in Federalist 51, where he says, uh, a dependence on the people is no doubt the primary precaution for keeping the government under control, but experience has shown mankind the necessity of auxiliary precautions. So things like the presidential veto, the bicameral legislature. Uh, that's, that's the government being, being kept in check, but not directly by the people. Because, I mean, partly because the people care too much, they're too involved. In a way, it seems like the, it would be handy if the people could be neutral observers and kind of judge how the government's doing and th there is discussion like that in the Federalist, the, the whole idea of responsibility, that the, the, the politicians do something and then the people judge it, but it's not a neutral judging. The people, the people get involved in the, in the dispute to begin with. I mean, Madison does stress, I think in Federalist 49, or stress isn't quite the right word, he, he allows as to how, of course, in, the, in some sense, it's the more logical, way of thinking about it. All power comes from the people. It goes to these three branches. They have a dispute. Well, you come back to the people to, right. to resolve it. And, and in normal life, lots of things kind of work that way, incidentally, if you think about it for a minute. You know, the, 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 delegate, the, the, the delegating authority kind of makes the decision about when, when, it, when the people to whom it's delegated are arguing, in a sense. Or the, but uh, he, that, that doesn't work for various reasons, including there wouldn't be reverence for the Constitution. I mean, that's, I think it is a wonderful example of how much more complicated the Federalist understanding of how popular self-government can work is than just let's hope we, the people are reasonable or let's even try to have a lot of civic education so they are reasonable or something like that. And, yeah. uh, and, that, and that the internal working of the separation of powers can both preserve liberty better, but also produce better government actually, right? More energy, more safety, more... Uh, less whimsicalness, so to speak. Uh, uh, yes, I mean, on, on the people's role, I just, you know, Madison says, on very rare occasions, constitutional amendment, that's, that's okay. You just don't want to be doing this all the time. And he's particularly critical of doing it uh, sort of ad hoc. Say when someone has a complaint, it, it would really be better to do it periodically uh, because if you do it every time someone complains, you're, you're leading the people to think this constitution is just, uh, you know, temporary and, and flawed. And what you need to do is develop a certain reverence. Um, so, right, the, you know, the, the, the principle of, of the people choosing the constitution in the first place is, is very fundamental and is not denied. And you, you have to allow that, um, you know, on the, I would say after Federalist 51, a sort of more elaborate view of these different branches is developed and you see their uh, individual merits. It's not just that they're checking each other and can um, you know, keep, keep each one from uh, usurping power. It's that they, you, you divide, divide up the legislative power, you, you create institutions that have different characters and different qualities um, you know, the, the concepts of energy and stability are, are what define respectively, I guess, the executive and, and the Senate. And those are qualities that don't come naturally to uh, government by, 
uh, by the people. Um, but I guess I also wanted to just mention representation uh, because you so the anti-federalists I think had a, a more, a, a view of representation that's really more like tends to be assumed today, which is you want representatives who, who look like the people who are really uh, samples of the people or uh, kind of common, uh, um, like the, the guy next door could be your representative, uh, almost as if they were drawn at, at random. And the Anti-Federalist, I mean, one of their complaints is with this national government, you're not gonna have enough representatives. So you're not gonna have enough of a minute uh, reproduction of the, the qualities of the people. Uh, the Federalist gives a rather different account. And you could say the, at the most um, elevated view of what a representative is, uh, Hamilton describes what a representative does is he, he conveys information to the legislative body. It's not that he's going as a lobbyist for his uh, district. He's, he's going to tell the other people about his district so that they can collectively decide what's advantageous for the whole. Now, this sounds a little bit like what, what I said in Federalist One was more ardently to be wished than seriously to be expected. And, and clearly there's also the possibility that representatives have a kind of partiality uh, and, and will push the views of their constituents. But I think this more, more elevated view is, is developed and also that you know, having a minute representative of each person doesn't really help you in the end, because if you have a representative who only represents you, he's just gonna get outvoted. And so what you need is representatives who can combine the interests and sentiments uh, of, of not only their constituents, but others. So this is, I'd say one of the merits of a representative is that he himself is not simply going to present his own views. He's already kind of aware of the diversity of views of his constituents. And then um, just one more kind of general concept, responsibility, which is the people get to judge how the government has done without having to decide what the government should do. In other words, we don't uh, prescribe policy, we judge the policies that have been invented by the politicians, or in some cases, we judge the results of those policies. Uh, this you know, reminds me of, of Ronald Reagan's famous, are you better off than you were four years ago? That's, that's what it means to judge the results of policy. And so you, each citizen doesn't necessarily have to understand why he's better or worse off, uh, but uh, you, you give the, the rulers kind of the opportunity to exert their own uh, judgment and, and then you, the voter gets to judge how they do. And this also improves the, the quality of the citizens because if we were all assembled in, uh, in person as in an ancient direct democracy, uh, we would be more likely to be carried away by some orator who would uh, uh, exert his, his spell on us. Uh, whereas at a distance, judging with a certain lapse of time, we can be more judicious. It is striking, I mean, how much the Federalist is concerned, though it doesn't highlight this concern, I would say it's somewhat almost, you could almost say it smuggles it in, uh, with the quality of the legislators, the quality of the president. I mean, the, 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 you know, it, it's, it, there's not a whole lot of exhortation of the way we sometimes see these days of a kind of civic virtue, Republican, you know, people should be wise and thoughtful. And, uh, but the system is somehow set up to at least increase the odds of people <laughs> of, of some wisdom and some thought and some, and people who are op open to that, at least um, becoming representatives or, or the system is, would make them a little more thoughtful. I do think one sees that in America, you know, you get Harry Truman gets as a, presumably, I don't know, a functionary of a, of a machine in, in uh, Missouri uh, uh, 
and uh, comes to the Senate and his, his vision is widened. And then of course becomes vice president or president and further yet. And, and I, you know, it's sort of a cliche and a, maybe a little bit of a story almost, of, you know, look, this ordinary man, you know, reaches, becomes much more impressive than people thought he would be. But I, I think there's something about the system that it's at its best allows that and the same with president others and members of congress and so and justices yeah. i mean i guess one thing i didn't mention is this determination for wholly popular government is not just a matter of everybody voting it's a matter of everybody having an opportunity to run for office yeah we'll talk a little bit about that because uh, ambition is so right that, important. You know, i think we're all political but we're not all equally political but uh, say, say generally uh, people are partisan, but not necessarily ambitious. And the ambitious people are the ones who become uh, the politicians. Um, you know, Hamilton, I think somewhere refers to in discussing impeachment, your right to hold office is really uh, your most valuable right as a citizen which hmm. makes you wonder, what, what, what about the right to vote? But it's somehow this opportunity, which also is something that, you know, when Abraham Lincoln had his famous statement to, to the soldiers, any one of your sons could grow up to be president. Um, I mean, that's part of this honorable determination that, that we are, are resting our experiment on self-government, that ambition is, is allowed. Um, it, there's another word that's used is government should be impartial to the pretensions of human beings. Um, and I think a pretension is something like a claim to rule. So if you want to rule, you're, you're allowed to try. Um, so uh, yeah, ideally that goes along with a certain thoughtfulness or, or I mean, there's some talk about experience um, that, that you get in office. Um, uh, you know, there, there's also a case for citizen virtue. I mean, I don't think they completely discount that. that you know, people have to be attentive. Uh, you know, the, I, I mean, part of, I think, the, the rhetoric insisting on wholly popular government is to encourage the people to um, maintain this sense of vigilance. Uh, for example, he says, if the legislature passes a law that says this law does not apply to the legislature, sort of trying to circumvent the separation of powers, say so what's going to prevent that? And the answer is the vigilant and manly spirit of the population who would simply be outraged by such a thing because that, that denies equality, that, that asserts uh, self-appointed rulers rather than rulers derived uh, from the equality of the people. Yeah, you quote, I think, that uh, those wonderful Lincoln remarks, which I think were genuinely uh, brief and ext extemporaneous to the Ohio Regiment, I think it is, in 1864. They're coming back through Washington as they're being, I guess, discharged or something. And and but he uh, uh, and they're they're pretty famous and very beautiful remarks about what we're what they're fighting for. And but yes, it is striking how much he stresses the. Of course, they're fighting for human equality and uh, a new birth of freedom and and uh, uh, opportunities for all. But he does also say that yes, he, each of you, you you could could hope, reasonably hope, I think that that your it's a, sons probably doesn't say sons and daughters can could uh, be and live in this great white. He's speaking for the White House, I think. So for live in this great White House as I as I do, or so I have been able to. To, uh, to achieve or something like that. And uh, yeah, so the ambition, Lincoln was of course very interested in this and attuned to this, but the importance of representative government not being a flattening of ambition, but really almost uh, allowing for a very grand ambition on the part of the citizens is, is and Hamilton very much says this too, right? And uh, in the Federalist. Um, the uh, demagogue, they're very concerned also about, I, I was struck reading the, so like everyone else in the Trump years, I we read the executive uh, section 67 to 77, paper 67, 77, more than the others probably. Uh, the concern with demagogues is really striking. I'd say I had sort of forgotten how much of it is about, you know, 
yeah, we it could be a problem, be a big problem if we, this can be this one person, and we really want to think of different ways to prevent him from being we'd like him to be as capable as possible, and thoughtful, and you know whatever experience. But also, we really don't want him to be some kind of uh, terrible demagogue. And so, uh, I mean, maybe say a word about that and uh, those precautions. <laughs> I mean, in in Federalist One, it seems as though a demagogue is is described as what might happen if we don't adopt the constitution that sort of we're we're in a situation without institutions this one of the kind of i guess natural results of anarchy is in, uniting behind some person who can can win this sort of support i think a demagogue also is especially to be found in pure democracy direct democracy where the, the people are assembled and are uh, he says, you know, the, 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 the demagogue rules uh, as if he were holding a scepter and sort of um, uh, has the people in his thrall. Uh, it is, uh, you know, one thing I noticed, it is striking how much of the discussion of the Federalist concerns a very simple uh, requirement of government, which is avoiding usurpation. Yeah. Because, uh, you know, we, we tend to think of these checks and balances as trying to result in better policy or prevent injustices and so on. But simply preserving elective government was not taken for granted. And sort of one, one of the ideas of having these multiple institutions is to try and prevent usurpation. I mean, the, the idea of, that someone would cancel the elections or simply seize power. I mean, this was not uh, not outside of their vision. And you can see, you know, when the government has not existed for 200 years, um, you know, that, that seems like a, a live, a more live concern. Maybe one of the successes of, uh, of the government that we can see is that elective government has, in fact, been preserved. There's a, uh, when Hamilton is defending the provisions by which the national government can uh, adjust the election uh, regulations of the state governments for congressional elections, uh, he takes on the objection that says, well, you know, anti federal will say, well, what if, what if Congress tells everybody they have to go vote in one specific place? And that means that most people aren't able to vote and this will deprive them of their uh, uh, popular government. Hamilton says, you know, if you have some usurper who wants to take over, he's not gonna amuse himself with these clever schemes. He's just going to boldly announce, you know, I'm, I'm in charge and, and cancel the election. So this, this was an idea that, uh, you know, that, that was, was uh, known to them and that they were trying to guard against by creating these institutions. I do, I do think this, and this is where I think your book, and I hope this conversation is so helpful, that whatever, there's a ton of interesting things to be learned from the Federalists on particular institutions, the fundamental branches of government, which they discuss. But there's many things that have, there are many things that have developed over the years in America, uh, and could, that could be judged by the way of thinking about politics that the Federalist encourages and, and helps educate us to, and whether it's Civil military relations, how do you have a military that's not going to make usurpation easy, whether it's the bureaucracy, how much do you want to have civil servants, but you don't want to simply have civil servants, you want to have political control, administrative law. I mean, I'm not saying all these, some of these things could be criticized probably as not optimal, so to speak, from the point of view of the Federalists. They give too much weight to, I don't know, efficiency and not enough to responsiveness or to democratic uh, control or the opposite or, you know, uh, uh, thinking about the, the executive, the, so much of an emphasis is put on the Electoral College, the original Electoral College, which quickly went away, but as a way of preventing an unfit character from becoming president, because you're going to actually have these people who are you know, senior statesmen, so to speak, in their communities, uh, you know, selecting the president, and they're not going to select some, you know, terrible demagogue, and that goes away pretty quickly but it's replaced by the party system, which has its pluses and minuses, but also is a kind of way of, you know, tempering the ability, presumably, of a demagogue to simply sweep over the country and stampede everything in, in his or her, his in those days, direction. Um, and, you know, one can think of other institutions that maybe continue to do it or not do it in the case of the party system, you know, which was not much anticipated by the Federalists. So I, I guess I, I'm struck 
is just thinking about it more yet, how much, how helpful it is to take the federalists seriously, even if one is thinking about institutions that aren't specifically discussed in the federalist or, or, uh, or, or those institutions have changed quite a lot. Yeah, I think the general question that, I mean, maybe I would commend to your audience is how has this plan worked out? Um, you know, what, what of it has worked as intended and to what extent do changes really amount to very large differences from, from the intention? I mean, I think there is a kind of, I would call say nostalgic patriotism that says, you know, the, the founders were great and if they could see what we've come to today, they would just roll in their, their graves. And I have to say this, I mean, there's something to this view, but it doesn't quite capture, I think the founders self-understanding. I mean, they, they don't present themselves as idealists who are uh, creating some uh, utopian system and then will be distressed when people don't live up to their standards. They, they think of themselves as very practical, hard-headed people trying to create a long-lived system. So if something has gone wrong, you'd have to ask the question, well, what, what did the Federalists, or what did the founders get wrong? What did they not see or did, did they make some mistake? So, I want to ask I, you to give us some guidance on that, but, but also, uh, but I would also say, don't you think they, they also understand that the system is not going to run of itself forever and it requires people maybe not quite at their level, but at a high level to be able to think in a broad way and therefore shepherd in reforms or amendments or, in, or other institutions that help accomplish some of the goals of, 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 the, of, of the broad goals of the Federalist in, in reconciling good, the aspects of good government with, with popular government. So they wouldn't, it's not right. supposed to, it's, this isn't once and for all that everyone just gets to go about now doing their own thing and in this system they've magically set up and they're just gonna chug along without anyone attending to it. Right, it's not automatic, but so they thought their system would, or, or they intended their system to encourage the sort of thoughtful contributions you, you're just suggesting. And so you'd have to ask, has that happened sufficiently or if it hasn't happened, is there something about human nature they didn't quite get or has human nature changed in some way? Um, I mean, I think it's, you know, it's very hard to sort of assess the overall, say, success of the regime. I mean, by the Federalist's own standards, we'd have to judge, has this regime in fact served justice and the public good? Uh, has it shown the right amount of energy and stability? And, you know, you'd have to think about all of American history and you'd have to think about kind of the counterfactual, what, what, what are we comparing this to? You'd have to think about things that maybe were quietly discouraged by the institutions. An example is a, a historian said that impeachment has been practically useless because it's hardly ever used, but that's not, you know, a clear finding because if it deterred bad behavior and you never saw that, that would be an important contribution. Um, so, uh, you know, the, this is a very big question. So how, how has it worked? What, what do we think of it? Um, I think it is possible to look at some more specific aspects and, and observe that you know, either they've worked as, as planned or, or there's, there've been departures. I mean, I guess I don't, I'm not, not sure I quite agree with you about the electoral college where I would say Federalist is a little bit um, uh, brief on the electoral college and not entirely clear on whether the electors should simply transmit the people's view or should have a view of their own. Um, Hamilton summarizes several times, he says, this is an election by the people. Now, maybe mm -hmm. that's just, you know, a rhetorical coding on this elitist mechanism. I think as, I mean, the Electoral College is an interesting thing in itself because it was kind of put together at the last minute at the convention and exactly what it was supposed to do is um, not, I would say entirely clear. Uh, it seems to have been partly have in mind this problem of nomination. That is, how do you how do you get the uh, the field down to two? Um, 
Right. And in the in the old days, there was this: each elector votes for two people, which has a different effect because if if one person is not the favorite of a majority, maybe the second choice um, will be. Yeah, their their version of ranked choice voting there almost right <laughs> in a way, <laughs> in a mild way. Yeah. Right. Although you know, even with ranked choice voting, um, I don't think it's quite solves the problem because you could still have number three in the rankings would actually be the second choice of the people voting for number one and number two. Right. Um, and number three gets, you know, eliminated when you get to that round of the counting. I mean, um, just, I, I would say in general, this problem of nomination is sort of a case where you, you rely on voluntary uh, human ingenuity. I mean, what, whatever system you have, you create, an opportunity for people to try to figure out, uh, say, how to how to promote a certain candidate. Um, in the for the founders themselves, there's this description of uh, the necessity for some respectable set of citizens to take the lead in creating this proposed constitutional convention and and the constitution itself because the people can't spontaneously, uh, unanimously decide on anything. And the same sort of problem arises when you're uh, trying to settle on a political candidate. You really have to narrow down the field. Uh, I mean, one of the problems the Electoral College was designed to solve is that different states may not all have the same idea of who, who the uh, plausible candidates are. So it, it remains a, a sort of strikingly sort of, <laughs> informal process, which I think is reflected in today's primary systems where, yeah. you know, it's, it's really not a kind of clean institution with a clear structure. It's more like each state has these, its own calendar and its own um, procedures. And somehow a, a candidate emerges. But that, that's part of the, the informal aspect of, of government. And I suppose if one were trying to reform that system, yeah, the Federalist gives guidance on how to think about those reforms. Don't be, you know, some utopia, it's, you know, one national primary day in each party and be more democratic. Every vote would count the same, whether you live in Iowa or in a late state, so to speak. But, but that wouldn't necessarily, merely being more democratic isn't enough, but certainly being undemocratic isn't a good idea either. And how do you mix in a sense these, you want to allow people to, I mean, I think the way we think about it is shaped much, you sort of suggested this indirectly. When we're thinking well, the way we think about politics is much more shaped by the Federalist and by the experience that then grew up out of, in, in this country and in other liberal democracies than we realize that as we sort of do instinctively know, you sort of want to balance uh, what we call name ID now, but let's just call it experience. You know, you want to, that it's legitimate that someone with much more experience should have some edge. On the other hand, you don't want to preclude Barack Obama from beating Hillary Clinton. So you want to have a system that somehow allows also for, you know, some the rise of an ambitious and talented person. And so how do you balance those? I'm not saying our system is at all perfect or that anyone would, you know, there are probably a, many ways it could be improved. The less of the federal should also be to be a little wary of, assuming in a facile way that these improvements are easy though. So uh, if it's worked over time, maybe leave it, if it's okay, leave it. If it hasn't worked, then be interested in changing it. I guess I've been struck recently just thinking about this, that it seems to be the two things that aren't in the spirit of the Federalist are a kind of, you know, facile progressivism, let's call it, where you assume that, you know, because of science or whatever technology or just political science uh, or economics, we just don't need to think in this complex way about politics anymore. And it's all being taken care of, so to speak, uh, on the one hand, or a kind of facile, what's the word, uh, you know, you call nostalgia, let's say reactionary nostalgia, that this has been this way for X amount of time, and we're not even going to think hard about whether it is, you know, with new conditions, do we need to rethink certain things, whether it's, you know, obviously the tax code or the election electoral system or more guards at the federal level for state officials being able to maintain to keep the election results, you know, uh, against uh, populist, uh, uh, against demagogic appeals to the people to overturn them if they don't like them and so forth. So there's a kind of, I don't know, mix of flexibility and uh, 
principle isn't quite the right word, but you know, stand, ways of thinking about politics that the federalist seems to me to embody more than almost most than almost anything else because it is a practical work, but it's also, you know, uh, more than just a practical work. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I wanted to say about the um, sort of subsequent development. Uh, I mean, one of the striking things, of course, is the the much increased size and scope of the federal government. So, you know, there's a case where it seems as though something like the intention of the founders has has uh, been eclipsed. Um, but, you know, the, the Federalist does not have a kind of uh, legalistic view of the Constitution, or let's say that's not the, the main point of a Constitution, that we're not creating a Constitution that sets very clear limits on what government may or may not do. I mean, it, you, you can try, but this was sort of their claim against a Bill of Rights is that you can't really specify things and that, that unequivocally and that they, they describe that as parchment barriers. So what you really rely on instead is the, the struggle between institutions. And when you, if you think of the, the growth of the federal government, you know, there, there is the suggestion that as the federal government shows itself to be more trustworthy, the people will tend to, to uh, want it to do more so that the, the boundary between the state and the, and the federal governments is set by this sort of political process. And also that the federalist view, I, I would say, that the cool and deliberate sense of the people should ultimately prevail over the views of the rulers. It sort of implies, you know, if the cool and deliberate sense of the people is say the new deal was a good idea and we need these kinds of social insurance schemes. I don't think the Federalist would say, you know, sorry, that's contrary to our principles of protecting individual rights or, uh, I think that's part of what it means to have a wholly popular government. You don't just do whatever the people think of at any one time, but a sort of settled popular opinion, uh, you know, needs to be deferred to. And so I think the Federalist would you know, probably accept uh, even some policies that they themselves would not have, have recommended. As they accept some, I think some almost explicitly in the Federalist, right, some aspects of the Constitution that they kind of make clear they're not really thrilled about. I mean, uh, the, this sort of very half-hearted defense of a couple of them, as I as I recall. Uh, yes, well, um, I say the equal vote uh, of each state in the Senate was a kind of bugaboo for Madison. I mean, this is, of course, called the Great Compromise, but Madison was sort of steaming about it. Uh, uh, and never really reconciled himself to the idea that this was was reasonable. So in the Federalist, he just says, well, it's superfluous to uh, evaluate by any theoretical argument uh, the reasonableness of this. We just have to realize that it was a compromise and try to think of reasons that, that it might be good. And how to make it not damaging as well, I suppose, at some point. And if one were actually... Uh, Right, although it, it is it is the unamendable or one unamendable yes, it's, provision of the Constitution. So, um, I, right. I guess the argument for the ticklish nature of revising constitutions uh, kicks in in favor of um, of that institution. I mean, you could say the, the whole idea of instituting a government by consent, actually rather than theoretically. You know, in practice, it means you have to get the consent of some unreasonable people who want extra senators for their small state. Or say in the case of the three-fifths clause, you, they had to get the consent of the Southerners who wanted extra representation for, for, for slaves. And you know, the, the unreasonableness of these claims doesn't mean you can simply ignore them. I mean, if, if you are Lenin, uh, you know, you can have a vanguard that imposes what's right, but if you want to have government instituted by consent, you have to work more 
uh, I'd say gradually and uh, start by getting consent of the actual people with power and, uh, and look toward future improvement. And the people are already organized in these states. Uh, maybe that wouldn't be the case in every founding. Maybe you'd have just people in a nation after a war or something uh, able to be reorganized more easily. On the other hand, you want to take advantage of the fact that they're organized in states, obviously. I mean, it's a huge advantage to having that. And so, but I think it's a very good lesson and the Federalist understands it this way, that it's both an annoyance at times that we you're stuck with certain institutions, compromises, limitations on the ability to kind of, um, for, what did Thomas Paine say, for, you know, start to form the world and you, and you or something like that. That's not the way when it is in, the, in real government by consent. In, in locks, in theory, you could have a state of nature and you should use that to inform your thinking in certain ways. But in practice, it's a good lesson for today's reformers and with whom I'm sympathetic in some ways about the frustrations of the Senate and even the Electoral College of, you know, think hard about ways to work around things that you can't change. And there are maybe even good things about the fact that you can't change them. It's not, it's not nothing that we have a certain same system for the last two centuries and the same rules. And I think it gives us real stability and so forth to people's citizens' perception of the government. On the end, it is a little odd to have Wyoming have the same number of senators as California, but maybe that should affect the way we think about the rules of the Senate and uh, other ways of distrib distributing power and so forth, right? I mean, it, it, at least we're kind of complexifying the people's thinking about politics. I guess that's uh, what I come back to rereading the book and talking to you uh, as opposed to a kind of, you know, cutting the Gordian knot kind of simplification. I mean, one thing that struck me in, in thinking back about the book is, I think there's a kind of changed um, intellectual atmosphere. I think in, in 1984, I think I was at some pains to try to persuade people that this was worth thinking about because people had a certain complacency and thought, you know, this, this is our constitution. We, it's working okay. Um, and so why would we need to really pry into it or, or understand it? I think since then, you know, there's a lot of discussion of how our government is dysfunctional and uh, decaying. Uh, people talk about veto points instead of, you know, appreciating checks and balances. Uh, you know, the, there's something called the World Values Survey, where every few years they ask people a lot of different questions, and one of them is, what's what's the best form of government? And uh, still, the the winner. Uh, in the U.S. and in a lot of other places is uh, representative government, but the, the margins have been shrinking and especially among young people. So I, I think uh, maybe a, a return to the arguments for this form of government is, is more necessary than, than it seemed when I first took an interest. But also perhaps uh, using the kind of thinking that the Federalist embodies to reform certain aspects of our government as well too, right? Because they were, they were, they were pretty big reformers. At this one. Uh, right, one, right. Um, one, one forgets that sometimes in the uh, talk about the founders, you know. <laughs> um, any, any last thoughts on this has been, I think, very interesting and educational for me and I trust for our audience. Any last things you would urge people to think about as they go reread the book, The Federalist, and then we, of course, reread your book as well. But any, uh, I am curious, but yeah, other things, I mean, you mentioned the current cli intellectual climate, political climate, would they be surprised? I mean, would, how much would they, you mentioned effective polarization and in, in passing, and yeah, I discussed that with Jonathan Rauch. It is very striking when you think about it, how powerful it is today and maybe made more powerful by social media and stuff. But on the other hand, it's not something that that they would have been entirely unaware of, to say the least, right? Yeah, I think uh, it's an interesting question, say, how does communications technology change this? I mean, that in Federalist 10, you know, there's the fact that, you know, in a large country, you can't that easily get together with other people in your faction is an important restraint on, uh, say, majority faction, meaning uh, attacks on the rights of others or, or the public good. 
And so communication seems to have changed that, made it easier. Uh, so does that um, change things? Do, do, do people's, um, you know, does the whole psychology assumed by the Federalists change as a result of modern conditions? I mean, I sometimes wonder, they say ambition must be made to counteract ambition. Uh, are politicians still quite as ambitious as they were in the Federalist view? Um, the, the prosperity and opportunities of modern life seem to open up other possibilities. I mean, maybe ambitious people would rather be Michael Jordan or Tom Hanks or something rather than, than a senator. So or a billionaire, uh, maybe much more. Yeah. Right. So, yeah. A billionaire. Yeah. Um, well, that's about, yeah. But, I mean, they would have been on the whole, of course, they were friendly to technological progress, so they probably wouldn't have thought one could stand in the way of uh, you know, communications technology, or certainly didn't want to stand in the way of prosperity. And uh, but you're right; there's but those raised their own challenges to to self government, right? Yeah, no, they were definitely all in favor of <laughs> promoting commerce and and enterprise and uh, and prosperity. But they would have been. They also understood it was. Uh, there's the new challenges for us because, you know, final point, I guess I would ask you to think about a comment on is because one part of, they want to settle certain things. They want to set up the basic form. So in some ways they would like the fact that we look up to the founders and don't think we can change, can or should, most of us don't think we can or should change anything, but they did uh, respect ambition and they wouldn't have wanted subsequent generations to just feel utterly constrained and, and uh, beaten down, so to speak, by these institutions they had inherited and uh, unable to uh, vindicate the, you know, the, the determination to show that this generation too can do something good for self-government. So it's a funny, uh, I think they wouldn't have minded a certain amount of uh, reforming ambition if it were well-informed. Uh, I think that's right. Uh, I guess that's, that's why I, was, was urging attention to the question of how their system has, has worked out and to what extent it was, um, you know, fully adapted to uh, or, or promoted the, the changes that have happened. So that should be the subject of our next conversation and uh, a comprehensive look at the whole system and how it's worked out, or maybe of your, of your next book, you know, sort of uh, informed by the perspective of the Federalist. Uh, that would be good, actually. I think it's a, a too big a topic for one person. So uh, <laughs> I urge it on your audience. Yes, we'll have multiple conversations about it. That's even even better, right? Uh, David Epstein, thank you very much for this, I think, very uh, interesting and, and genuinely thought-provoking conversation on the Federalist. And, and thank you for, for thanks for, really for, for joining me today. My pleasure. And, and thank you for joining us on Conversations.